Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Keith Egner. Egner is the Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Chair of Architectural History at the University of Oregon. He's the author of Louis Barragan's Gardens of El, El Pedregal and the Visual Sourcebook Cemeteries, a Norton Library of Congress publication. A native of Portland, he taught modern architecture and American art at Carleton College, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and the University of Missouri before coming to the U of O in 2013. Thanks, Keith, for coming on the show. Pleasure. So I know that your training is in art history. What led you to architectural history as a specialty? Um, I suppose it was just kind of a fortunate confluence of events. I was actually at Portland State as an undergraduate. I started out my first uh, uh, college experience was at, here at the uh, University of Oregon, which didn't actually go all that well. And uh, <laughs> I took a little time off and then ended up back at Portland State and was a general studies major and um, really kind of got hooked uh, uh, in a class uh, in art history taught by a woman named uh, Claire Kelly. She encouraged me and uh, I remember uh, seeing a television show called uh, The Shock of the New, mm. which was a popular PBS uh, series. Um, and I really liked what Robert Hughes, who Robert was the Hughes, time, yeah. the, the art critic for Time Magazine did with that show. Uh, around about the same time, I wanted to do something out of the classroom, and I just happened to be wandering around in an office. I found an office on campus that uh, arranged uh, for internships, and I ended up doing an internship with the Historic Preservation League of Oregon. I uh, wrote a National Register nomination for a uh, historic Portland house, which has later been demolished. Oh. Um, but anyway, uh, that kind of got me hooked, and then I started uh, studying architecture uh, later on in graduate school. So the first book is on the Mexican modernist architect Louis Barragan. Um, what, how would you become interested in those that mm. subject? Um, well, again, sometimes we create justifications for things we do <laughs> after the fact. Uh, uh, no, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> right, it wasn't my lifelong dream to write a, a book about uh, a Mexican modernist architect. Um, in a course I took at the University of Washington, by the, this time I was in a master's degree program, uh, a woman named Meredith Clausen, who was my advisor there. Um, I remember her one day in a, a lecture um, introducing this figure, Luis Barragan, whom I'd never heard of before. And um, his work is very photographic, very photogenic, I should say, um, which is one of the reasons why it became as popular as it did because most people hadn't actually seen the work, but the photographs of it by a hand-picked photographer named Armando Salas Portugal were so beautiful. A and they just, the buildings just looked so great in photographs, I really got hooked by them and wanted to know more about them. Um, after the fact, I realized this was a perfect topic for me because um, it allowed me to combine a lot of other things I was interested in, in writing about Barragan. I, needed to address issues of surrealism, of um, the connections between fine art or high-end architecture and uh, commercial practice. Barragan was also a very uh, uh, active real estate developer, so there's this interesting tension between uh, the artisticness of his, of his works, which they certainly are, uh, very carefully constructed tableaus, uh, and his desire to sell real estate. Mm. Um, so it just brought together a lot of different things, um, and it turned out to be a perfect project for me. Plus, it also meant I got to spend a lot of time in Mexico, which is, uh, which was a nice bonus. So, what is El Pedregal? El Pedregal. Uh, it means the the stony place or the rocky place. El Pedregal is a. Uh, an area just south of Mexico City. It's now incorporated into Mexico City, but prior to. Uh, Barragan's arrival there, it was still very much a, a sort of a volcanic wasteland produced by an eruption that had taken place a little over a thousand years before. And, oh, I think it was something like 80 square kilometers of, of volcanic fields that had never been developed by the Spanish, never been developed subsequently by, you know, the independent Mexican uh, nation. Um, it was a place that had become the home to a lot of uh, quite distinct and unusual 
uh, vegetation, some peculiar plants that didn't really grow anywhere else grew mm -hmm. there. And uh, it became very popular among uh, hikers um, and artists. Diego Rivera would go there and paint sometime, as did other prominent artists and less prominent artists. Poets wrote about the place because it was a very beautiful, distinct, uh, magical sort of place, you know, surrounded by these big volcanoes that had given it birth. It became uh, in, an, in an era of, of great interest in national identity in Mexico, which the 30, 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s were, it became seen by many as a kind of a kind of a birthplace of the nation, mm -hmm. you know, born from volcanoes and so on, with the gods and the, the mountains residing nearby and overlooking. It was also very popular, though, with uh, uh, bandits and earlier mm -hmm. on with uh, uh, revolutionary fighters and so on. Um, so it had all kinds of associations. Um, the uh, University of Mexico, which had been located in uh, colonial era buildings downtown, in central city Mexico, had quietly begun buying up land nearby there. And Barragan was a very shrewd character. He knew that this was going to be hot real estate. Huh. He'd started building some small gardens just for himself and his friends to enjoy there. But he got this vision of uh, a big real estate development. And it was really the first major modern house and garden mm -hmm. uh, kind of automobile-oriented subdivision in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, initially it was a little, little slow to start, but it uh, became very, very popular. And now it's the place where Mexican movie stars and yeah. ex-presidents all live. It's, it's, it's sort of Beverly Hills and huh. uh, the Upper East Side rolled into one. So um, what's his legacy for Mexican architecture? Uh, Barragan is the, you know, I suppose he's like the Frank Lloyd Wright of uh. Mexico. He's the most prominent Mexican architect. Um, you know, he's, the, he's the, the architect that appears on postage stamps mm. in Mexico. When he died, his uh, body laid in state beneath uh. the dome of the uh, Palacio de Bellas Artes, the Palace of Fine Arts. Uh, I actually got invited uh, to... Uh, a uh, ceremony celebrating the hundredth year of his birth, uh, which was hosted by the president of Mexico huh. at the time. So you know, he's a very big deal there. Yeah. What's so? Um, what? Well, he also launched a, a whole cadre, a whole generation of imitators. Uh, yeah. Some of them more talented than others. Uh, among the best known is uh, Ricardo Legarreta, who is a very well-known architect in this country. His, he had offices in Los Angeles. He built a lot in Texas and mm -hmm. around California and elsewhere. Um, so when you go to Mexico City today, you know, even, what, 20, nearly 20 years after Barragan's death, actually more than 20 years after Barragan's death, you still see a lot of buildings that look very much like his mm -hmm. buildings with kind of stark minimalist forms, solid, rough, textured walls, bright colors, um, openings just cut into the, the fabric of the building, kind of subtle uh, evocations of Spanish colonial mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Mexican vernacular village architecture. Um, it really became, again, in an era in which a lot of Mexicans, from politicians to architects and artists and choreographers and poets and novelists were all sort of debating the the nature of the the national identity, the national character. There were a number of architects who were trying to find distinctively Mexican expressions um, in the realm of modern architecture. Probably the best place to see that is the university campus where most of the major architects in the country built their various interpretations of what a Mexican modernism could look like. Mm -hmm. But Barragan's, in the end, was the most successful um, in terms of uh, appealing to an international audience. He, there was a show of his work at the Museum of Modern Art in 1976, which really launched his fame. And four years later, he uh, received the Pritzker Prize, often called the Nobel Prize of Architecture. Only the second architect to receive that. So he'd become an international star of a sort, you know. And that uh, was late in his career, right? That he was toward the end of his life, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Pritzker Prize came in 1980. He died in November of 88. Um, and uh, so his was, was only one voice in this, you know, in this debate about what the, the national modern architecture should look like, but it ultimately was the, 
the voice that prevailed. Mm. Uh, and so it, it became, in fact, kind of a, a national style. And a style with a lot of resonance internationally as well because of its interest in contemplative spaces, mm. in poetry, in beauty. The things he talked about, his use of colors became um, um, very influential on architects across the United States and throughout Europe mm. and Japan. So I'm going to shift gears and sure. ask you about your second book. So the second book is about cemeteries. So how'd you come to that topic? It's actually the third book. Oh, that's there, the, the third the book. The second book was a, an anthology uh -huh. of uh, articles on, fairly recent articles on different aspects of uh, American architecture. The third book was on cemeteries. Um, how did I come to that? Um, well, there's lots of different ways I could answer that question, too. but. Uh, I've always been interested in cemeteries. They're they're kind of like parks without the crowds. You know, mm -hmm. they're 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 interesting places. They're nice places to wander without a lot of uh, uh, other people to uh, get in your way, and uh, beautiful places to look at sculpture and uh, planting and uh, you know, read historical documents and so on on the uh, on the grave sites. Um, I don't know. They just I think they kind of appeal to some of my more uh, moody, melancholic uh, personality characteristics as well. There's a, I forget which, which novel it is, but there's a novel by Henry James where a character uh, points to this whole shelf of books that he'd written and he says, you know, if you knew how to read these books right, you would find that uh, linking all of them is a single idea. Um, I don't know that that's very easy for any of us to do to see what uh, the linking idea between all of our various projects are, but I, I do find that I am drawn to certain kinds of spaces, certain kinds of approaches to the built environment, and so I think there's actually a lot of, uh, of uh, connection between, say, Barragon's work, which is very much imbued with issues of memory and nostalgia. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a kind of moody, poetic sentimentality, in fact, to his work that I think made writing about cemeteries kind of a natural extension for, for me because it's, it's just something I'm interested in. When I was r doing a little research for this interview, I learned from r reading some of your work that, uh, that I knew nothing about the history of cemeteries in the United mm -hmm. States. Tell us a little bit about that history. Were there always cemeteries in the United States? No, there weren't. Americans always buried their dead, um, but they didn't do it in cemeteries. Um, the cemetery as we know it uh, really begins in the early 1830s. Um, prior to that time, Americans had buried their dead, certainly, but they did so in a number of other kinds of arrangements. There were municipal graveyards, which were run by townships. There were churchyards, which were run by churches or in other cases, synagogues, where people of those parishes would could expect to, to lie when, when they died. People buried their family members in you know, farm, or, uh, farm or family graveyards on their private property. But the cemetery is really a, it's a modern invention, in effect, uh, that harkens back to ancient Greece. The word cemetery is, is a, derived from a Greek term for, for sleeping chamber. Um, and in fact, the cemetery uh, in the United States was part of a larger Greek revival. The first cemetery in the U.S. was uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was located within sight of Harvard University. Right around the same time that Harvard hired their first chair of, 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 of Greek studies or classical studies. Um, and part of the thinking of the time, this was part of the larger Greek revival, you know, this era when uh, people were building buildings that looked very much like the, uh, uh, the Athenian Parthenon, and uh, um, there was an interest in reviving Greek rhetoric, uh, the speeches of uh, Periclean Athens and so on influenced the kinds of speeches that were being given in the United States in this era, and there was a lot of sympathy for this nation of Greece, which was the, the birthplace of democracy, which had found its ultimate realization in the thinking of the time in the United States. This nation, which had been under the uh, 
under the thumb of uh, the Ottoman Turks for centuries was now fighting for its independence and we a newly independent nation who had thrown off the shackles of, uh, uh, of our colonial era um, looked to Greece as you know, one of our sources. So there became a great deal of interest in things Greek. And uh, one of the cemeteries that Americans were aware of from the past um, had been the, the ancient uh, cemetery uh, in Ath Athens, uh, what was it called? I think the name is escaping me, I think Karamikos, I think it was called, which was near the academy as it happened, uh, the academy that uh, Plato had taught at this wooded area, very much like Mount Auburn was near the academy that was Harvard. Um, so this was the first cemetery called as such. Um, and it was, it was basically a private corporation. It wasn't, you know, municipal. It wasn't church related. There were all variety of people: African Americans, European Americans, Christians, Jews. You know, basically, it was a very open sort of place if you could, you know, pay for a plot. Um, so, what's happened to the aesthetics of like the gravestone? Have has that changed over time? Oh, of course. Um, like anything else that human beings make, things change over time. I mean, you know, look at the history of chairs. Basically, sitting just involves plopping your bottom down on a, on a seat and maybe reclining back against some cushions. So chairs don't need to change form. They change form because we want them to. Uh, in the same way, anything we make, from houses to cars to dresses to gravestones, change over time as as our perspectives change, as our aspirations and goals and beliefs about ourselves change. Um, if you look at the earliest American gravestones in New England uh, churchyards, you'll often see these, these very, they're kind of scary looking, you know, they'll often have um, skulls and crossbones and uh, uh, hourglasses with the sands running out, you know, and they, they seem very dark. These are what are called memento mori. Mm. Uh, as, as I am, the skeleton says, so will you be, you know, you will, you will come to the same end. Your, your, your body will, will waste away but, and only be reduced to bones. It is your spirit that really matters. You know, this was the, uh, the prevailing idea about death in Puritan America. But over time, you know, this begins to soften this view of death. By the time we get to cemeteries in the 19th century, if you go to a place like Mount Auburn, you'll still see a few, you'll still see a few skulls and crossbones, but much more common uh, by the 1830s, 1840s, and 50s are images of uh, weeping willows, or hands reaching upward, or hands reaching down mm. from heaven, or hands joined together, uh, or angels weeping. There's a, again, a softened, more sentimental, poetic view of death. Mm. Death is not just the uh, the stopping of the body and the release of the soul, but now it is regarded as a kind of sleep. It's just, it's, it's a sleep, and the cemetery is in effect a large sleeping city. Mm. Um, Rest and in peace. Uh, yes, it's a more, it's, a, it's, a, it's again a softened, more poetic mm. Victorian view. By the time we get to our own era, uh, again, things have changed dramatically. Um, we now have laser carved stones where you can translate a photograph using, you know, computers uh -huh. and lasers uh, to, you know, have a, a very, vi you know, a photographic image of yourself and uh, uh, icons uh, referring to your hobbies, whether you're a fly fisherman who drove a motor home or, you know, some guy who liked baseball and guitars, you know, you see all <laughs> kinds of things, all, all, all sorts of ways in which people personalize huh. their gravestones. Um, and then, of course, there's all sorts of other ways that we we uh, choose to make passage into the into the other world huh. as well. So, so I know you're working on a couple of projects currently, and I believe one is a, a book on the Kansas City architect Lewis Curtis. Mm -hmm. How, what's important about him? Why is he worth writing? Interesting about character. You know, in some ways, he's he's like a lot of other sort of regional figures um, who are not particularly well known today out of their regions. Um, you know, we um, if you if you look at a textbook on American architecture, you know we have a canon. You know there are these famous figures that again appear on postage stamps, and their works get uh, 
illustrated in textbooks over and over again, and these become the canonical figures. So when we want to talk about, say, for instance, progressive American architecture uh, of circa 1900 uh, that looks forward to the future, that uses new materials and technologies and uh, aims for a new style, we typically you know, refer to a figure like Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. And certainly he was an extraordinarily talented uh, designer and a really you know, significant thinker uh, about architecture and culture. Uh, but he wasn't the only one. And so he becomes a kind of a centerpiece with a, with a lot of somewhat lesser lights, but in many cases not so terribly lesser, mm -hmm. uh, that circulate around him uh, that we generally just don't know that much about. Curtis is kind of one of these figures. Now, I'm not suggesting Curtis was on par with Wright. He wasn't. Wright was really a figure of international consequence. Curtis maybe less so, but he was still a really interesting figure. You know, sometimes when you're living in a place and you're casting about for topics, you decide you want to write about something local, regional, and you want to get to know your region better. Curtis was a figure um, that I just kind of stumbled on when I first moved to Missouri some years ago. There's very little, almost nothing written about him, and yet his buildings were really quite interesting. Uh, they lack the consistent formal language um, that Wright's work has. He's, he's much more eclectic. He jumps around stylistically. But toward the end of his productive years, he does begin to develop a kind of a signature style. Um, and it is, it's, it's, it's indebted to Wright, but also to other things like uh, uh, Japanese architecture and uh, the Vienna Secession, which was the Viennese version of the Art Nouveau. Um, and he's, he's an, he's, he is a figure of regional importance, but he also is really, a, if, if, he, if he's uh, not a major technological innovator, he's at least a very early adopter. He was the, uh, arguably the first architect to use caisson foundations, mm -hmm. which is a way of, uh, of, of mooring the foundations of a building uh, effectively in somewhat spongy ground. And this became uh, really essential to the building of skyscrapers in Chicago later on. Uh, the much better known architects, Adler and Sullivan of Chicago, uh, used Curtis's ideas in uh, some of their early buildings. Um, he was also um, one of the first architects to build a, a true glass curtain wall mm -hmm. where the exterior walls of the building are hung like a curtain from the metal skeleton that lies underneath. So he was quite an interesting innovator, um, technologically speaking. And again, he speaks of a really dynamic and exciting, uh, interesting and complex period in the life of a major American city, a city that uh, perhaps hasn't really gotten its its due in terms of um, American cultural history and American architectural history. Um, so that's what I want to look at. At UO, you hold the Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Chair in Architectural History. Who was Ross, and how do you understand your role as the Ross Distinguished Chair of Architectural History? History. That's the hardest question oh, so sorry, far. I don't know. Uh, well, uh, Marion Zian Ross was a distinguished architectural historian, um, one of the founders of the Society of Architectural Historians, which is the leading uh, professional body that I belong to, an international uh, congregation, if you will, of architectural historians. Um, he was an American scholar who uh, was one of the, the founders of the art and architectural history track here at the University of Oregon, which has a, a long and distinguished pedigree. Um, when he died, he uh, left behind a substantial sum of money both to found this chair but also to uh, endow uh, the library. And we really have an extraordinary rare books collection here. Uh, it's been building over the years, but he, at the time of his death, I believe that was perhaps the largest gift ever given to a, an mm. American, the largest single gift ever given to an American architectural library. Now, while we're not on par with, say, Columbia University's Avery Library, uh, which has been collecting for you know many, many years and has you know the most important architectural collection in the world, we do have a really impressive, really rich collection of materials. For instance. Uh, 
1910, 1911, Frank Lloyd Wright published something called the Vosmuth Portfolios, which was kind of a vanity publication. These are very beautiful drawings made by him and members of his studio of his works up to that point. He paid for the publication of these, these big, beautiful folio drawings, very lavishly produced. Um, there were a thousand copies of this published in uh, Berlin, uh, 1910 and 11. Um, we have two and a half of those, you mm -hmm. know two and a half of those complete sets. So again, we just have some real riches. Uh, Ross's bequest, or, uh, Mary and Dean Ross's bequest to the university made possible the acquisition of things like that. As far as how I understand my role here, uh, uh, well, um, in some ways it's the same as my role would be anywhere else I was mm -hmm. teaching. I, I, I think of myself as a, a cultural historian, a, an historian of material culture whose material happens to be the built environment. For me, this was a really exciting opportunity, uh, not just to come back to my native state, having grown up in Portland. Um, I mean, I've been living away from Oregon since the late 80s, and it's just, I'm thrilled to be back. Uh, but also to come to a really first-rate school of architecture and a really first-rate uh, art and architectural history program within a school of architecture. Um, so we both have undergrads and master's students and PhD students in art and architectural history, but I also get to work with practicing architects and landscape architects and urban planners and historic preservationists. It's just a great environment, wonderful resources and a, a rich and wonderful history of, uh, of terrific people working here. I have at least eight or ten colleagues in my own and other departments who write and publish quite seriously on architectural history and terrific students. So it's a great place to do what I do and I really love it here. So Well, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to talk to us and to tell us about your work and to tell us about your position. Welcome back to Oregon. We're glad to have you. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, I've been speaking with Keith Egner the Marion Dean Ross Distinguished Professor of Architectural History at the University of Oregon. Thanks so much for watching.